Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Anthony Chafee, and today's interview will be with Professor Thomas Seafried in what I think is probably the most important interview I've ever done. Professor Seafried is one of the world's foremost experts in cancer and cancer biology and research, and he has actually shown quite conclusively that our understanding of cancer is all wrong. And by being all wrong, our approaches to treating it are all wrong, and so we're not getting the results that we should and could be. So please, if you know anyone with cancer, or anyone at all who'd find this interesting, please share this. This is very important to get this message out. So please get the word out there. Please share this video. It's very important. Thank you very much. All right, hello everyone. This is Dr. Anthony Chafee, and I'm here today with a very special guest, someone who I've long admired uh, his work, uh, Professor Thomas Seafried of Boston College. Uh, Professor Seafried, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Yeah, well, thank you very much, Anthony. It's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks. You. Um, so I was just going to say, uh, for people that aren't familiar with your work, can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do and, and some of your uh, current projects? Yeah, well, thanks. Um, I'm a professor of biology at Boston College. Uh, I, I teach cancer metabolism uh, every semester uh, to a select group of uh, undergraduate and graduate students. I also teach uh, general biology to the the folks that uh, are not not science majors, like like the economists and political science folks and English majors and those guys get the get to try to in- increase scientific literacy uh, among the population. Our research program um, we have a very active research program supported by private uh, foundations, and uh, our goal is to develop diet drug therapies for managing uh, cancer. Uh, and I mean all, all types of cancer. So um, that's, our, that's our big thrust uh, right now is what, is what is the most efficacious diet drug combinations that can manage cancer uh, without inducing toxicity to any of the normal cells or tissues of our body. And uh, what we do then is we collaborate with clinics uh, that are treating cancer patients throughout the world. And we share the knowledge that we have from our preclinical studies with the directors of these clinics so that they can start applying metabolic therapy, non-toxic metabolic therapy to their patients in these clinics. And the success that we're hearing and coming back is quite astonishing. Uh, how this is working. So we do, we ferret out everything before we put it on patients and the, my clinical colleagues will then apply it to the patients. So we have everything uh, planned in advance and we get feed forward feedback information. So what we do is we, we tweak our systems in house here to see if we can improve uh, therapeutic efficacy and then share that again with the clinical groups. And we're constantly making more and more advances and perfections in the, in the strategy that will eventually become the standard of care for all cancer patients. That is metabolic therapy. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly hope so. And I, I know I've read, <clears throat> you know, some of your papers and, and specifically on like glioblastoma multiform, which is something that, uh, you know, I'm in, in neurosurgical uh, residency at the moment. So that's, that's obviously, you know, the, mo- one of the most common things that we see and is, is an absolutely devastating uh, disease, uh, you know, obviously you know, w- without any sort of treatment, people on average live about three months with treatment, they make it, you know, you know, 15 to 18 months. And, and this is uh, a very, very devastating illness to watch, watch someone have to go through. Um, you, you have you've obviously copious amounts of, of publications and some of your publications talk about uh, cancer as a metabolic disease and specifically a, a, a dysfunction of the mitochondria. Uh, can, you, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So, um, I mean, this goes back to the work of Otto Warburg uh, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, where he defined that cancer originated from damage to um, mitochondria. Uh, and that then elicited a whole series of changes, uh, uh, forcing the cell into a fermentation mechanism to survive. 
Um, and and we, we have uh, validated and confirmed Warburg's original finding. So in order to do that, uh, what I did uh, was to go <clears throat> through the, through the, liter the scientific literature, looking, looking at um, electron mic mic micrograms, the very high um, uh, magnification uh, of, my of mitochondria and tissues, because you can't see them under light microscopy. In order to look at the structure of the mitochondria in the cytoplasm of the cell, you, need, you really need electron, um, um, electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy. And then when you look at, so what I did is I went and I looked at all the major cancers, probably representing 95% of all uh, cancer deaths caused by, by these kinds of cancers. And, in, and I went back through the 50s and 60s, 1950s, 60s, 70s, because in a lot of uh, 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 medical schools, uh, people would be looking at cancer tissue with electron microscopy. And then you go to those papers and, and you look and see what they found with respect to the, the number and structure of the mitochondria in those tissues. And invariably, they were abnormal structurally. And even, in, even if one were to isolate them and look at the biochemistry, it was abnormal. Um, so we have never found normal mitochondria in any kind of a major cancer. Okay, so if you don't have normal mitochondria, that means your, the cells are not going to be able to generate energy through normal respiratory systems like oxidative phosphorylation. And this is exactly what Warburg said. He said, mitochondria, oxidative phosphorylation, becomes irreversibly damaged in all cancers, regardless of where they come from, thereby forcing them into a fermentation mechanism. And that's what the characteristics of all cancer cells are. They ferment. And, and then what we did is what we did is we, well, Warburg knew glucose was the lactic acid fermentation derived from glucose was the major fuel at that time. We have now defined uh, glutamine uh, as a second fermentable fuel. The field had think, thought for many years that glutamine was being respired. No, it's not respired, it's fermented. So the two fermentation fuels that drive the majority, if not all cancers, are a, a sugar fermentation and an amino acid fermentation. And without the glucose and glutamine, no cancer cell can survive. So our, our goal is to scientifically validate fermentation uh, mechanism for a glutamine and, uh, and show how Warburg was right uh, on his original description, but he also did not have new information which would clarify and, saw, and, and resolve this entire cancer issue. And we're in the process of doing this right now. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and so what are, what are some of the things that, you, that can disrupt the mitochondria to make them precipitate cancer? And, and how, does that, how does that go about? You know, I've seen you know, some of you talk, you talk about how this actually precipitates the genetic uh, uh, mutations that we see in, and attribute blame to as causative. Um, but you're saying that that's actually a knock-on effect. Yeah. So they're all, the mutations are all downstream of the phenomenon as, as are most of what people are studying today um, are all downstream, the angiogenesis, the uh, failure in apoptosis and all, all these kinds of things. They're all downstream of the original damage to the mitochondria. So to answer specifically your question, it's called the oncogenic paradox. Mm -hmm. And this paradox has uh, perplexed the cancer field for decades. In other words, um, how is it possible that you could get cancer from a whole range of different kinds of insults? How, what, is it? what is the common pathophysiological mechanism that could underlie this uh, range of cancer initiators? Um, like for example, some people uh, 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 women may get breast cancer from a clogged milk duct. Another one may get it from some sort of viral infection. Another one may get it from a, a unhealed wound. There's a whole variety of different ways that could elicit, elicit a breast cancer. You can do the same thing. You can consider the same thing for possible colon cancers um, or bladder cancers or lung cancers or any of these kinds of things. In other words, there's not any one, uh, of course, smoking, uh, would damage uh, the mitochondria in certain uh, lung tissues and possibly other tissues. Intermittent hypoxia, you know, uh, radiation, um, chronic inflammation. Any any of these kinds of insults could damage a cell in a particular tissue, damage the mitochondria 
of a cell in a particular tissue, leading to dysregulated cell growth in that tissue. And the definition of cancer is cell division out of control or dysregulated cell growth. How does that happen? It happens from damage to the mitochondria in a particular cell or populations of cells in a particular tissue, el eliciting a growth, uh, a dysregulated growth. And that's the oncogenic paradox. So you don't always get cancer from a single insult. It could come from a variety of insults. The bottom line is that you end up with cells that are uh, dysregulated in their cell growth, all of which are fermenting. Um, and it's important to recognize that the mitochondria of our cells is the controller of the cell cycle. So when that organelle becomes defective, the cell falls back into a, 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 a dysregulated cycle leading to, uh, and this is the way all cells uh, on the planet uh, evolved before oxygen came into the atmosphere 2.5 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. We had living cells on the planet before oxygen was in the atmosphere and they were all fermenting and they all had dysregulated cell growth. So the cancer cells in bodies are simply falling back on these ancient pathways that have always existed even before respiration, even before the origination of the mitochondria. Mm. So the cells are just simply falling back. And as long as they have fermentable fuels in the environment, they're very difficult to kill. Radiation and chemo and all these things that we use are not at the heart of the problem. And as a matter of fact, some of the standards of care actually facilitate the availability of fermentable fuels, making the, the management of the disease impossible. Mm. So that's why the current standard of care makes no sense when one considers the origin of the disease in the concepts of evolutionary biology. Yeah. Um, I, I did <clears throat> read a study you know, a number of years ago where it spoke about you know, when people go into a ketogenic diet and it's speaking specifically about using ketosis in order to buy cancer and, and talk about mitochondria specifically and showing that when in a state of ketosis, you actually, your mitochondria, first of all, uh, were more efficient and they also increased in number. And so, it, you know, and it's this uh, sort of mechanism that uh, uh, would, would protect from cancer. Um, what is it about, eating car carbohydrates and not being in ketosis that just jams up our, our mitochondria so much? Well, I don't, I don't think the carbohydrates uh, jam up the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. um, what, what happens is uh, excessive amounts of carbohydrates facilitate the, um, it causes an inflammatory mm -hmm. uh, condition in the body. And it's this, it's this elevated uh, inflammation, the state of an inflammation uh, that uh, uh, contributes to the damage. So you know, sugar itself is not a carcinogen. Right. However, uh, chronic consumption of excessive carbohydrates can put the body in an imbalanced a nutritional state. And that's what elicits, it's not only cancer, it's type two diabetes, it's Alzheimer's disease, it's cardiovascular disease. Essentially, it's all of the major chronic diseases that we are currently suffering from is the result of excessive amounts of carbohydrates in the diet. We as a species did not evolve to eat uh, large amounts of carbohydrates. It was only a seasonal kind of situation. A, a ripe fruit, a ripe berry, or something like this would be the sweet, maybe honey. It wasn't chronic exposure to high levels of carbohydrates that are coming from the foods that we presently have in, in our societies. And that is ultimately the origin of the majority of chronic diseases that we have is a, a diet that what is, does not fit our evolutionary past. Yeah, I 100% agree with you on that. And, and that's something that I've sort of argued for a while now, which is that, you know, the chronic diseases that we're, we're treating nowadays, you know, exactly as you've outlined are, are not diseases per se, but, you know, toxicities and malnutrition, to toxic buildup of species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific mm -hmm. nutrition. And, yeah. and, and you build up these toxins, as I sort of mentioned to you before, um, before we started filming, you know, I, I got into this, I, when I took cancer biology and we talked about all the carcinogens, you know, at the time, this was 20 years ago, there was, uh, we were told about, there was 136 known carcinogens just in Brussels sprouts and over hundred in mushrooms and so on. So, uh, you know, plants obviously using defense chemicals to stop predation or deter predation, this can build up and cause these, 
these uh, toxic effects in our body. And uh, well, well, let me say that I, I think that's true for the industrially produced mm -hmm. vegetables. Mm -hmm. I think uh, organic vegetables, if one were to use natural fertilizers, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, as as would be as would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. I think you can reduce significantly. Mm -hmm. But the problem is the um, organic foods are hard to come by. There's no known, it's not known whether they're really organic or not. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any regulatory commission, um, you know, uh, of free range animals or, or organic plants. I mean, this is what we evolved to eat. They were all organic, you know, 50,000 years ago, there was no yeah. industrial harvesting of foods. Um, but, uh, but I, but I think that uh, organically grown uh, um, vegetables, if one could do that, uh, um, you know, with natural fertilizers, I think those would be very, very healthy, uh, yeah. along with any other uh, free range uh, of meat products or things like this. The problem is they're not convenient for the majority of people in the society. You know, a drive up McDonald's hamburger is a hell of a lot easier than going out and shooting a deer in the woods. Yeah. You know, uh, um, it, it's just the way our society is mm -hmm. um, and, and our demands on our time and what we do uh, prevent us from actually rebalancing our, our our physiology, but yet we put ourselves at risk for cancer and all these other chronic diseases by the convenience of our lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, no, I, and I certainly agree. Like any any sort of you know whole foods approach, you're you're going to be in much better uh, stead. Um, you know, one of the things that that uh, you know, we went through was uh, actually a guy from uh, Berkeley, uh, Professor Bruce Ames, and he published in 1989 uh, some work. Lo looking at comparison to ALAR, which was a, um, a pesticide used on apples at the time, they were trying to ban it. And he actually showed that uh, he was looking specifically in mushrooms, that, that mushrooms had around 10,000 times the amount of uh, you know, natural insecticides and pesticides by weight uh, as, as the ALAR would get uh, pumped on these plants. And that mm -hmm. it, was, it was more likely to cause cancer than natural ones as well. Um, but yeah, hundred percent, you know, obviously, you know, um, pesticides, insecticides, these are toxic by design. They're trying to, to, you know, kill insects from eating them. And so certainly that's going to make things uh, a lot worse. And well, uh, we, we, and, we, I, when, in my book, I showed that a lot of these so carcinogens that you just mentioned, hmm. they're, at, they're taken up in mammalian cells mm -hmm. and, uh, they actually cause the mitochondria to fluoresce. They call bio, hmm. biofluorescence. So you can, you know, they those carcinogens are going right to the mitochondria. Mm. and uh and damaging the mitochondria which is then yeah. the first step the first step in the initiation of cancer is to disrupt oxidative phosphorylation and only cells that can upregulate a fermentation mechanism as the result of this damage can become cancer cells mm. cells that cannot upregulate fermentation rarely if ever become tumorigenic cells of cardiomyocytes they can't uh, switch from oxphos to fermentation okay. neurons in the brain rarely become tumorigenic. It's the glial cells, not the neuron. Neurons can't ferment for very long. So only cells that have the capacity to replace respiration with fermentation can become a cancer cell. Otherwise, you, you can't do that. Oh, that's very interesting. And I think that's that's a good uh, illustration of, of what the actual mechanism is going on as well. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. it becomes very clear. Once you understand yeah. the biology of the problem, um, uh, understanding how we how we get it, and more importantly, understanding how we manage it uh, yeah. be becomes very logical. The problem is this information is not known by the majority of uh, oncologists or yeah. scientists in the field. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I'm just you know, that, that you know, with, with my sort of endeavors into, into nutrition and how this affects uh, disease, you know, even, even just the idea that, that uh, you know, diabetes and heart disease um, are, are, you know, caused by sort of eating, eating a lot of carbohydrates and sugar and all these sorts of things. A lot of people uh, really don't know that, like doctors and nutritionists as well, and they still sort of are on the same, you know, cholesterol will kill you sort of idea, which I think has been thoroughly debunked. Um, well, you know, it's been debunked, but uh, everybody's popping the statin tablets. Obviously, they, they still think cholesterol has a big big role in it. cardiac. It's triglycerides. Yeah. Um, y y you're, you're absolutely right, you know, and, and in the cancer wards, they still give the, Cancer patients say, you know, uh, sugar and Coke and ice cream cake. Mm. Um, yeah. And then they yeah. say no, glucose has nothing to do with cancer. So there's, 
there's such a lack of knowledge yeah. that it's profound. It's it's cosmic. It's it, it's unbelievable. The yeah. lack of knowledge on the part of the healthcare industry as, as to what what should and should not be done to keep people healthy. Yeah, that that's one of the things that, you know. I I sort of was you know uh, was a bit upset there because I see this every day in the hospital. You know, I see the food that they they feed them. It's just it's just sugary carbs. That's it. Yeah. And it, there's almost no meat. There's certainly no fat. Uh, there's a bit of dairy, but it's it's always like chocolate milk as opposed to just yeah, normal yeah, milk. And and the rest of it is just is just garbage. And I'm yeah. I'm going around seeing our brain tumor patients and who just underwent uh, surgery and and here they are eating all this this sugary nonsense. And I just can't help but think, I mean, like this is this is what gave you this problem in the first place. And we're and we're just shoveling it into your face. Yeah, it drives the, it drives the tumor. And, and what we also found, um, I published a major paper on this uh, with the standard of care for, for brain cancer. Um, the very treatments that are used, the um, uh, radiation, as well as temozolomide, um, they free up massive amounts of glucose and glutamine in the tumor microenvironment, hmm. uh, making long-term survival very, very rare. So it's the therapies themselves that, in other words, that's bad enough to have a glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. It's even worse to use standard of care to treat it because you've more or less signed and sealed the death certificate of this patient. Um, simply by, the, the human brain should rarely if ever be irradiated. This is nonsense. This has to stop. People, mm -hmm. I published a clear paper on how the radiation breaks apart the glutamine glutamate cycle in the brain, freeing up massive amounts of glutamine and the, and the uh, steroids they give these patients increases blood sugar. The yeah. two fuels necessary for causing cancer cells to grow out of control are made available in abundant quantities by the very treatments that we're doing uh, to these patients. Yeah. So um, we have made no advance in glioblastoma therapy in almost 100 years. And my le most recent paper shows in 100 years, we have a telescope that now orbits 1 million miles from Earth to look at the very origins of our solar system. Um, uh, this new telescope, I can't remember the name of it, but, but anyway, and, and, yet, and yet we do that and we've made no, no advance in glioblastoma. Yeah. So, so uh, and many other cancers. Once you have metastatic lung cancer, a colon cancer, the, the survival is, is so much less because the treatments we're using contribute to the demise of these patients. It's unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. It's a tragedy. That's actually a tragedy. Is, yeah. And, 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 you know, chemo can be so hard on people and, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't know what people are more concerned with like getting cancer or getting cancer and realizing that means they need chemo because, you know, I've had, I've had friends and obviously uh, patients devastated by, by these treatments. Yeah. I think they fear the treatment as much as they do the disease. They, yeah. don't, they think their hair is going to fall out. They're going to bleed from the gums. They're going to be sick and tired all the time. You know, many people are. Some people recover really well. It's actually, um, there are some reports now that show water-only therapeutic fasting can significantly reduce some of the toxic effects of chemotherapy. Hmm. But my, my, my point is, why would you want to use chemotherapy when we know we just have to pull the plug on the fermentable fuels with yeah. diet and, very, and drugs that aren't not, are not so toxic? especially yeah. when under therapeutic ketosis. I mean, there's a clear framework and strategy for managing cancer without toxicity. The biggest problem is no business model to support this, yeah. which is the singular greatest stum uh, uh, inhibitor of moving this forward. There is no way yet that people have found out how to make money uh, yeah. on metabolic therapy. That's the biggest problem. Yeah. Not the, it's not the patient that should be benefited. It's how to make revenue from this. I think the entrepreneur will come and the entrepreneur will figure out how to do this. I'm not that kind of a person. My job is not, how do we keep cancer patients alive with a higher quality of life beyond what they were ever predicted to, to have? Yeah, I suppose a, a good business model would be just setting up clinics that, that have this uh, treatment regime and actually get results and then people will, will go to them. And, uh, and that might- Well, we're doing uh, that now, actually. We have some yeah. clinics that are, but you know, some of the drugs that we use like 6-deoxynorleucine is not available to the public. And, okay. and, and it really bothers me because that was used on children 
and uh, cancer patients and other uh, indications in the past. Um, but yet, uh, if you try to get it, the, uh, the drug would say it's not for human use, not for human consumption. Uh, and that, that, that should not be because that drug is very, very powerful, especially yeah. when used in ketosis. We, we did the experiments, we showed the results, and, and my patient, hundreds and hundreds of cancer patients are emailing me, how do I get this drug? And the answer is right, your senator and congressman. They, they, they should, because it's a, 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 it's a drug um, what would be repurposed. It was used on cancer, but it wasn't used in the right way. If you don't know how to use the tool, it's not going to give you the, the, the outcome that you would have expected. They say, oh, it's too toxic. Relative to what? Chemo and radiation? No, not even close. So you have, we have a drug available that can be used right now to, so, to result, reduce cancer in so many patients when used with nutritional therapeutic ketosis. We've already shown how it works and it works really well and it should be used right now. But it's not because there's no profit in this drug. So if there's no profit, we can't use it regardless of the patient. Can right. you believe this? This is yeah. what we call a moral issue. Yeah. Is, is there any way to sort of push through, uh, you know, obviously getting it, getting it approved uh, by the FDA to get this, this going? Or is there just, there's just no money behind it? Or you, know, it's um, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's all, I think it's all a revenue generation. I, yeah. I, I'm sorry to say that. The FDA will approve drugs um, if there's a proof of concept. Nothing could be stronger than the proof of concept of how this drug, Dawn, 60-oxyneuroleucine, works with ketosis. Nothing is as strong as this. Yet it won't be approved because there's no revenue to be generated from this. Yeah. So it's a business model. People have to realize that uh, uh, cancer is a revenue generating disease. Yeah. Hospitals uh, use drugs and radiation because they generate so much revenue from the insurance companies, all right? So one all has to go back. So is it, are we, uh, um, are we interested in keeping people alive longer? Yes, only if it can be associated with revenue generation. If yeah. it's not associated with revenue generation, I'm sorry, we have to sacrifice those cancer patients. Yeah, I wonder. There if it is. It, yeah, you know, I, I wonder if um, you know. Just obviously, you know, I'm, I'm in Australia at the moment, so we, there's a there's a public and private system here. But in in the public system, obviously, this is this is coming from the government, and and it is and there are massive delays. So it can actually take four and a half years for some uh, someone to get into our clinic with uh, like radiculopathy, a compressed nerve in their spine that needs surgery. Four, four and a half years is our current wait list for that. So there are a lot of delays and there are a lot of issues, but we deal with a lot of, of cancer as well. And those get, you know, obviously uh, treated right away because it's an, a life or death emergency. But the, you know, the government really tries hard to not pay for anything that gets done and they, and they put a lot of roadblocks in their way. And I just wonder, wouldn't this be something that would be attractive to them? Because this is, this is eminently more ch uh, cheaper than the actual standard uh, treatments. But I think that, well, you, you may, may have some ideas, but I, I think maybe it's that a lot of, a lot of hospitals and, and systems around the world that, that have a public model generally you know, try to emulate the guidelines set in America in the private system with the, with the insurance that sort of, sort of driving things. Yeah, you, know, you would think so. You, you would think this would be the best thing for governments to, you know, yeah. cut their medical bills. Uh, no, 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 no. There's a force. There's more power uh, that's controlling this. Uh, yeah. Even though the governments would like to do this, uh, uh, IRB institutional review boards have shot down this so many times. Mm. Um, they want to do standard of care first before they do metabolic therapy. Why? Okay. Well, there's something else going on here. Um, it, it, there's, and again, it has to do with the control of the entire medical system, how, what we call standard of care. Standard of care should have never been written in granite, but it seems to have been written in granite. In other words, you can use metabolic th therapy only after you uh, demonstrate that uh, conventional chemo and radiation don't work. Mm. Now for glioblastoma, 99% of the time they don't work. So yeah. you think that, so why do we have to continue to uh, push ineffective therapies. Uh, and once we realize they don't work, then we maybe we want to do metabolic therapy. No, no, no. You should do metabolic therapy first. 
That's the number one. Do metabolic therapy first, and then you'll be shocked at how you won't need toxic radiation and chemi chemicals. And that is not what the system wants to hear, period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that, that obviously needs to, to change somehow. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Well, who's going to change it? Yeah. Right. I, don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, which, you know, the bottom line is you just keep treating patients with metabolic therapy and let the patients be the advocates of what's going on. Let yeah. them go out and tell people what they did. Why are you still alive? How come you're not dead? You should have been dead three years ago. And you're yeah. out here, you know, yeah. working in your garden. Uh, and he'll tell you, those guys will be more than happy to tell you what they did. Yeah. Well, that, that's the thing. Um, not even to, to the extent that you're talking about actual, you know, treatment um, modality with, with diet and, and drugs. But I, I had a friend of mine who was diagnosed with a glioblastoma multiform about six years ago. And, and I had already been in, involved in this, this sort of research and, and seeing a lot of, of work uh, from yourself and others. And I just, I just said, Hey, look, there's, there's a lot of, you know, uh, evidence here suggests that, that at least being on a ketogenic diet is going to be very, very beneficial. And I, I sort of, you know, pitched a, a carnivore diet because that's, that's, uh, you know, my thing, but she didn't do like a whole carnivore diet. She did more keto, but she ate a lot more meat. She cut out the carbs. She stopped drinking and she's now six years still alive at, at five years. She had an MRI and she had no sign of disease. Unfortunately, it did come back in her sixth year. So she's sort of going, undergoing a further debulking, but five years and, and her five-year MRI was, was clear. That's yeah. um, almost unheard of. In, with GBM. Yeah, well, see, those kinds of cases need, need to be written up. And the, pa yeah. the patient that we wrote up, uh, Pablo Kelly, who has a, a website and talks about his survival, uh, he chose no standard of care, just metabolic therapy. And he was a carnivore on, on the carnivore kind of diet. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so he's out now eight years and uh, um, his tumor right. is not going, it's there. He mm -hmm. has a debulking surgery every three years. Um, uh, and no radiation or chemo. He'll give you a, the full story about what very kind of a colorful guy from De Devon, England. Um, and he's out there uh, and he's, he used the carnivore uh, procedure, but no carbs, you know, he cut all that stuff out and he's still going fine. He's had two children. You know, he was 26 when he was diagnosed, lived a horrible uh, uh, lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as he said, alcohol and drugs and bad food and all that kind of stuff. And then of course, when, after his tumor, he became very pristine in what he was doing and he's still doing fine. But um, yeah, but I think we're, we're seeing now that there's two things you need to, that we think need to happen. Number one, uh, avoiding the standard of care. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, uh, switching your entire diet and lifestyle over to zero, a very low carbohydrate, whether you do that with carnivore or whether you do it with plants, you know, you can, you can do it with either or. Uh, and we developed the glucose ketone index calculator to allow uh, people to know whether, they're, whether or not they're in a state of uh, nutritional ketosis by blood markers. You can do keto mojo blood glucose ketone meter. So the, pa the cancer patient knows. And when Pablo went off his diet a little bit, he start the tumor started to grow again. And you could see mm -hmm. it on MRI. And immediately he threw himself back into a very low uh, GKI index, and you could see the tumor stop stop growing. It was very clear. So uh, nice. uh, the diet and, and and the cancer cells can't burn ketones or fats. They only they only can burn glucose and glutamine. So wh whatever you and there's no diet that will target glutamine. Um, so one always says, oh, how am I what am I going to eat to target glutamine? Glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in our body. Now. It's, I'm so shocked at how long people can live with just ketogenic diets or these kinds of things. But if we ever married those diets with the glutamine targeting drug gone, I think we could eliminate these tumors and the majority of people very quickly. So mm -hmm. we're not doing that. We're not doing the very things we need to do to make cancer a very manageable disease without suffering great toxicity. Mm -hmm. Why are we not doing this? Because nobody knows about it. They don't know yeah. it. And the ones that are in charge don't want to believe it. OK, if you go to most of the oncology uh, centers, oh, there's no evidence to support metabolic therapy. And if it were so important, we would all know about it. Ah, wrong. <laughs> You're not. No, you wouldn't know about it. And there's a and, 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 and people don't want to. You, you're dealing with the with a meal ticket for an entire industry here. <laughs> Let's yeah. be honest. Right. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, so, so with the Dawn, um, so going to the, to the, the drug and diet uh, cocktail. So is this something, you, you know, obviously they're not letting us use this in humans, but we've, we've, uh, or you've done uh, quite extensive animal models. Is that right? Yeah, we've, we've looked at it in, in a variety of metastatic and invasive brain cancers and things like this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all of these drugs, I mean, Don was used in humans. It was used in little kids with leukemia. Okay, so it's not like it's a drug that's never been used on humans. Of course it's been used. It's in malaria treatments. There's a lot of ways that that drug has already been used, but not for cancer. Mm. Okay, so, uh, um, and there's other, you know, of course, you don't think the pharmaceutical industry knows about glutamine targeting? So what they do is they build drugs that, that are not nearly as effective as Don, patent that drug, and then throw that drug out on the cancer population, never using keto with it. Right. So you get some therapeutic benefit, but you're not going to get the full therapeutic benefit. The, the cancer can be managed with drug diet cocktails. People need to know that. We clearly showed how nutritional ketosis can facilitate the delivery of these drugs to, to, to tumor cells. Three, three times more. That means you can lower the doses, reduce the toxicity, and increase the efficacy of the whole process. So we know the framework. We know how to manage cancer without toxicity. The problem is it won't be used in the clinics for a variety of different reasons. And the people themselves have to rise up and say, I want metabolic therapy. Forget mm -hmm. about all this crazy nuking and poisoning people and doing this kind of nutty stuff. I mean, it's, it's not based on the of what we understand the biology of the disease to be. So who's going to make the change? The guys at the top medical schools? No. Mm. It's going to be the people themselves. Who, who will benefit most from metabolic therapy? The cancer patients will benefit most from metabolic therapy. They need to understand this. They need to rally. They need to do some, put pressure on your government officials and these kinds of things. Then we'll, it will happen. It's never going to happen when you're trying to convince big pharmacy and big medical schools that metabolic therapy is the way to go because it's not going to generate the replacement revenue. Yeah. So you have to have something that's going to give replacement revenue, but you want, in my mind, I want to see how many people can survive long-term like your, like your friend, like Pablo Kelly, like many others who should have been dead a long time ago are living a hell of a lot longer with a higher quality of life. What's wrong with that? Yeah. Why, why is this, a, why is this being resisted? Why is there resistance against this? Does it, it makes no sense to me, right? Yeah, yeah. So especially with something like cancer. I mean, like, like if, if, if there was ever something to rally behind, I think I think cancer is it. I think that, you know any sort of uh, anyone you talk to around the world, like they always have sympathy for cancer and people that get it. So I, I would, I just be, I'm just amazed that that these things aren't. Um, well, the other thing you have to keep in mind is that the term cure has mm -hmm. been a very reactive kind of term. Um, and we never use that term, uh, cure can't. We don't say we, a metabolic therapy can cure cancer. Mm. What metabolic therapy can do is allow the patient to live longer. It's a management uh, strategy. You can manage the disease, okay? In other words, you don't have to die uh, so quickly. You, you, you can live a lot longer. I'm not saying you can cure. How are we going to know if anybody's cured? As I said, okay, if, you're, if you have cancer at your age, you look very healthy. Uh, suppose you get cancer and you manage it with uh, metabolic therapy and you die at 99 from a heart attack. Well, you obviously were cured from your cancer because it wasn't, yeah. it didn't kill you. So we don't know uh, whether anybody is cured using metabolic therapy. All, all we know is that they seem to live longer than they're pre predicted in a higher quality of life. What's wrong with that? Yeah. What is wrong with that scenario? Yeah. And not being right? burned down by the, like the chemo and radiation as well. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest. If uh, don't forget, we have we have millions of cancer survivors who have survived toxic radiation and chemo, mm. but their body pays a significant price yeah. for that. Uh, they're suffering from uh, uh, gastrointestinal problems, neuropsychiatric problems, hormonal imbalances, um, uh, microbiome disturbances. I mean, all kinds of things that make their life less, less enjoyable, less pleasurable uh, uh, because they were exposed to toxic poisons and toxic radiation. This is stone age. This, this should not happen in today's uh, day and age when we understand the biology of the disease very clearly. And yet we're doing these crazy things to these poor people. You yeah. know, it doesn't make any sense to me.
Uh, I had a, I had a very good friend of mine that I, that I grew up playing rugby with and he unfortunately contracted uh, sarcoma in his sinuses um, probably when he was late thirties and mm. he uh, late thirties, early forties and very fit guy, very active guy, but you know, and, and he, and he went on and kept going. He, he, he struggled along with this for about three years. Um, one of the chemo agents that he used just completely destroyed his, his nerves. He, he became almost crippled from this just from a, from basically half a course of this chemotherapy. And he, and he stopped it. And he just said, even, even though the cancer was, was responding well to it, he just said, look, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to survive cancer to be a cripple and an invalid, yeah. you know? Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. not going to well, take you, that one. No, I, I, I have uh, hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of uh, situations like this because I, I, I get uh, thousands of people emailing me and they always have a story. And the, what I feel so bad about is they always uh, contact me after they've been suffered through the standards of care and their stories are horrific. I mean, you can't torture human beings uh, as well as, as what, what some of the standard of care does to people. I don't even think waterboarding would, is, would be as bad as, no. as some of the treatments they give these cancer patients. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. this is tragic. I mean, it's, yeah. I, I, it's, it, it, we, we can't laugh about it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tragedy yeah. of monumental proportions. And we don't have to do this. Um, you know, some of the chemotherapies, our colleagues in Turkey use what we call a metabolically supported chemotherapy. And they use the lowest doses of chemo together with nutritional ketosis, which has rather really good, good outcomes. And they said they would prefer not to use any chemotherapy, but they're forced to do it by the system. Mm. So the system uh, of treatment seems to have permeated all healthcare industries in, in, in societies throughout the world. Um, you go to India, I was shocked at how they love radiation over there, radiate everybody over there for every, any kind of a cancer. I think I figured that they might, cultures, I thought there, various cultures would be more open to metabolic therapy, but there seems to be a lock hold on cancer treatment throughout the world. Um, they have to do this radiation and chemo, and now it's immunotherapy. You know, the, the, prob the problem, CAR-T immunotherapy, such a costly and um, very complicated, uh, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? All they have to do is pull the plug on the glucose and glutamine while under nutritional ketosis, and yeah. you don't have to spend $265,000 to have your cancer managed. Yeah, you see what I'm saying, and yeah. and it comes right down to this whole concept of what is cancer? Is it a genetic disease or is it a mitochondrial metabolic disease? And you know, once you realize that it's a mitochondrial metabolic disease, most of the treatments we're doing to the cancer patients make no sense. It's not based on the fundamental underlying what the disease is. Yeah. So I don't know what I have what we have to do to get the word out, but yeah. um, somebody has to know about this. Otherwise, we're just going to continue to kill these poor patients year in and year out. Yeah. Let's be honest. In the United States alone, I don't know what it is in Australia. Uh, in the United States, we are uh, over 1,600 people are dying every single day from cancer. Over 1,600. When I was in China, it's 8,100 because their population is large. As a matter of fact, in China, cancer has replaced heart disease as the number one killer of their, of their population. Jesus. Right? Yeah. So what the hell is going on here? Yeah. And they're always saying, oh, you know, making major breakthroughs. I said, where's the breakthroughs? You want a breakthrough? You should drop the, the death rate. There's no breakthroughs. It's, it's, it's business as usual. More and more cancer deaths, no accountability. I'll tell you, we're always running around, raising money for cancer patients. You know, let's do the 5K run for breast cancer. Let's do this. What do they do with all the money that you get for raising the, they give it to the people who think cancer is a genetic disease, keeping mm. the, the system in place. I mean, it's yeah. nuts. We got, we got to start wising up. And people have to start asking, where the hell is the accountability for the money that I'm raising? The only people who get healthy are the ones running and swimming to raise money for the cancer. Do a bike ride. You get healthy doing a bike ride. But that you raise the money and you then you poison and irradiate the people that you're raising the money for. I mean, it doesn't yeah. make any sense, does it? No, no. And, and that's the thing, too. You know, uh, uh, it's a good point that you raised. I mean, cancer rates are, you know, getting worse. You know, like, you know, cancer eclipsing heart disease in, in China. Uh, as as a, as the number one killer, you know, I I, so, I sort of looked at at some of the the, the gross figures uh, in the U.S. since, and I was looking at 
you know, since we sort of overhauled our, our diet after the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol is going to cause heart disease. And, you know, we reduced our uh, fat cholesterol intake by about 30% increase or reduced red meat by about 33% and increased fruits and vegetables, 30, 40% increased carbs, increased sugar, all these things. Since then, there's been roughly an overall uh, tripling in cancer rates in the, U in, in the United States. You know, that, that cannot be genetic. You know, our, no. our, anyone who studies no. population no. genetics you know, knows very well that that is not possible uh, to do yeah. that in a, in a limited number of generations like that. So yes. that, that, that means there's something in the environment that has changed and has affected this. Well, here's the other, the other statistic that's often used to say we're making uh, major advances in cancer. Um, mm. uh, the anti-smoking camp that was started probably around 1990, 1991, uh, smoking uh, cancer uh, was associated with smoking. So if people stop smoking, so you use the 1991 rate of increase compared to today, and you say, look at how much, how fewer cancer patients we have today based on 1991 data. Yeah, because everybody was smoking and dying in 1990. Not everyone, many people were smoking and dying. So, but but if you look at the number of dead bodies uh, accumulating every year, the number of dead bodies accumulate at, at the same percentage as the population growth. Mm -hmm. So uh, every year, the number of dead people from cancer goes up. American Cancer Society has all the numbers. They all publish it every year. So this is a well-documented event that cancer death, numbers of dead people increase every year. You don't use a 1991 rate to predict how many. You're saying, oh, if we continue to smoke in 2022, uh, we would have had a lot more dead cancer patients. Yeah, of course you would. Yeah. But you stop smoking. So the only, the only the major advance was prevention. We stopped smoking. Right. And therefore, reduce lung cancer is still the number one killer. But it would have killed a hell of a lot more if we didn't stop smoking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the treatments, you have to look at what are any new treatments that reduce cancer deaths? And the answer is zero. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a tragedy, no matter how you look at it. You yeah. know, um, and yet the poor people in the hospital suffering immensely, you know, hair falling out. I said, anytime you see a bald cancer patient, that person was treated by someone who doesn't understand the biology of the disease they're working on. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't be bald. You're trying to kill cancer cells. What the hell? Why your hair falls out? Yeah. Oh, the hair and the cancer cells share. A, they're both growing. But you don't yeah. want to kill all your gut cells, your hair cells. That tells me you have no idea. So they use these terms precision medicine. Well, how in the hell do your hair falls out with precision medicine? You know, or other adverse effects, off target. Oh, so if it's so precise, how come we have all these off target effects? On yeah. the person's body. I mean, this is such a bunch of crap. I mean, yeah. wh when are they going to wise up to understand what's going on here? It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. uh, um, you know, that, that's another thing too, uh, something that, that you, you point out um, is that in, in a cancer cell, in, in a cancer, like a tumor, uh, we, we get taught in, in medical school, obviously you get these genetic changes and then this thing just starts propagating that and it's, it's basically monoclonal. Uh, but that's not what we see. We don't see that in tumors. We see uh, certain ones that have certain hallmarks and changes and, and increased um, you know, mitoses. But a lot of these things just look normal. They just look like normal tissue, and yet they behave as cancer. Um, that, that sort of to your point, you know, is uh, you know, if, if, they, if these all have varying genetics, why are they all acting the same? You know, that, that definitely looks like a downstream effect as opposed to a causative effect, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. A absolutely. The, now, the other thing that we're, you're, you're 100%, but every one of the cells in that, in that tumor is fermenting. So right. they're all fermenting, but they all have different genetic uh, characteristics, but they're all fermenting. So why are we so concerned about targeting the genetic mutations that yeah. differ in every single cell of the body when the, when the tumor cells are all fermenting? That's, that's the power of the somatic mutation theory. If the somatic mutation theory says cancer is caused by genetic mutations, mindlessly, we go out and try to target all these different genetic mutations. But on the mitochondrial metabolic theory says that they're all fermenting. So, but the, the field has not yet accepted the mitochondrial metabolic theory as the origin of cancer as Warburg had originally it threw him under the bus. When yeah. Watson and Crick first discovered the DNA structure, everybody ran off like the lemmings over the cliff ch chasing the, the DNA mutations. Yeah. You know, it's like the dog chasing his tail. The, the, now we've come to realize that all that genomic millions and billions of dollars spent on all this genomic stuff. Now, wh what we're finding though, which is very now interesting, is there are certain spontaneous mutations 
that actually interfere with glucose and glutamine metabolism. So we call these therapeutic mutations. They're actually God's gift to the cancer patient by a rare event. Nobody knows. Yeah. People like Pablo Kelly has an IDH1 mutation. Okay. It's called IDH1. IDH1 mutation produces a metabolite tor called 2-hydroxyglutarate. And we have found that two, uh, we and others have found that 2-hydroxyglutarate interferes with the glutaminolysis pathway, driving the energy of the tumor, and also the glycolysis pathway, building the raw material so the tumor can grow. So the mutation itself is acting like a drug that can target two of the pathways driving the cancer. Can you believe yeah. this? And people that have this mutation are known to live twice as long as the people who don't have the mutation. Mm -hmm. The problem is even the people with the mutation are given radiation and chemo, which, yeah. which reduces the ability of the, of the very therapeutic mutation to work. It's unbelievable yeah. if, you know what I'm, if you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you don't do standard of care and are fortunate enough to have this therapeutic mutation, you can live a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is the Pablo. Pablo has the therapeutic mutation, goes on a carnivore ketogenic diet, and uh, every three years has a debulking surgery because this indolent tumor just hangs around. But yeah. he's never used the uh, Dawn to target and kill off the rest of it. So, um, so we have a strategy, I think. But it's really, when you understand the, the biology of the disease, you can't help but be bewildered and overwhelmed by the, by the new information and how easy it is to get rid of cancer or manage it, let's put it that way. I would say get rid yeah. of it, but certainly manage it. It becomes a clear uh, strategy. It's just that more and more people need to know about this. And, uh, and uh, once they know that there'll be a stampede for this. Yeah. What, what are some of the uh, cancers that you found that are, that are more susceptible and sensitive to this sort of uh, metabolic treatment? Well, the, 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 other, the, the, the alternative question is which, which cancers have, been have, have I found to be resistant? Okay. Yeah. Uh, to this, because they're all, almost everyone is susceptible. Mm -hmm. um, every lung cancer that we've looked, every breast, colon, bladder, kidney, they're they're uh, they're all they're all very very prone. They all have to ferment. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, and blood can all the blood cancers are all driven by glutamine. They're in the blood, you know. Right. So so you're, you're you're talking about all the major cancers. You know, here's the situation. There are reports in the scientific literature showing some mouse. Uh, uh, a genetically engineered mouse that has a genetically engineered lung cancer that doesn't respond to metabolic therapy. Now, the problem is, is we don't know any human being walking around the planet that has been genetically engineered the same way as this mouse has been genetically engineered, nor does that, does that person have a genetically engineered lung tumor. Yeah. So uh, until we can find that person and ask that individual why they're not responding to metabolic therapy, I don't know. But you know, all of our all of our uh, mouse models that we found all have naturally arising cancers. Ca mm -hmm. In other words, the cancer arose naturally in the natural host. This is the the best model that you can use because yeah. because it's the same kind of cancer that would be found in dogs. Um, if a dog cancer arising naturally in the dog host, a human cancer arising naturally in the human host. Those are the kinds of cancers that respond to metabolic therapy. Some of these genetically engineered things are not responsive in some ways. What reasons, I have no, no clue. I, I don't know why a mouse that's been so genetically engineered with both the, the host and the cancer doesn't respond to metabolic therapy. But I think I'll leave that for the next, uh, in the next uh, uh, 10,000 years. Let somebody figure that one out. But who cares about that? Who gives a rat's ass about a mouse that's been genetically engineered that doesn't respond <laughs> yeah. to metabolic therapy, right? Yeah. Let, let's, let, let's focus our attention. Like dogs, for example, they respond remarkably well. Dogs with cancer. Cancer kills more dogs. It's like the number one killer of domestic dogs. The wolf yeah. never has, or rarely, there's very, I don't think there's been a, a cancer in a very rare in, in a wolf because um, they're eating natural, they're eating their natural diet in the wild. You know, they're, they're not ch uh, pounding down big burgers or, or jelly filled donuts and, and this kind of thing. Uh, and then if you go to the zoo uh, and ask the zookeeper, why are you feeding your chimpanzees, you know, uh, their natural, you're giving them their natural diet. You know, why don't you let them eat jelly filled donuts and pizza and drink Coca-Cola? And what the zookeeper told me down here at the Franklin Park Zoo in Boston, 
oh, that would be animal cruelty, a- a- animal abuse. Mm. And I'm saying, what the hell, man? We're 98% yeah. similar to the chimp and yeah. genetic and protein, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. take chimps and put them in an American diet from the time they're, they're weaned. Weaning, take chimpanzees. Let's take 100 chimps from the time they're weaning and give them only what we eat, right? Yeah. Not their natural diet. What do you think is going to happen? Cancer, dementia, type 2 diabetes, obesity, all the same shit that we have would be seen but you can't do that because it's animal abuse <laughs> yeah yeah well that, and that's it you know they and they have, have the science says you know do not feed the animals this isn't their natural food they get very sick and then we put that same nonsense into our mouths and and, and, and don't think that anything bad is going to happen you know no we get very sick <laughs> yeah yeah and the food industry and the pharmaceutical industries are both linked yeah. i had one of my students go and look at the investigation between the two organizations like the big oh. the big food industries producing all these foods that are poorly nutritious uh, and full of high, uh, pr- highly processed carbs make you sick. And on the other end of the, uh, the spectrum, the pharmaceutical companies will give you drugs and therapies to try to uh, make you uh, he- healthy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what an industry, right? Yeah. It's an unbelievable. You, it, it's the dri- it drives the economy. So I guess we have to be happy because we're all, you know, uh, many of us are doing well based yeah. on the, and the revenue generation from these two industries overlapped with each other. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I think that prevention is one thing. Uh, people who know about this certainly can, even Otto Warburg said you can't get cancer if, you're, if your mitochondria remain healthy. Hmm. So, uh, uh, and that's true. You can't get cancer if your mitochondria remain healthy. That's prevention. But we live in a society where it's hard not to eat. You know, I, okay, you, I saw you cooking the giant uh, tomahawk ribeye. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think that's wonderful. And I would eat it, but also with a big baked potato and a big loaf of bread with butter slathered all over it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And a big pile of unhealthy vegetables. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, everybody would go down that path, but eating the tomahawk ribeye by itself. Well, I don't know about that, but I, I certainly would certainly do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, (laughs) um, (laughs) that's funny. Um, I was going to say too, one of the, um, one of the things I thought, you know, exactly as you say, that uh, you know we don't see cancers in, in in wild animals, and we don't and we don't see them in the zoo. You know, everyone says that well, you know, animals in the wild they probably don't live long enough uh, to get cancer, but that you know that never explains animals in the zoo or they're or they're active and they're running around. But an animal in the zoo is sitting in a pen its whole life, and they live you know out their their natural life. They don't get these cancers, and the you know the cancer rates in dogs and cats and domestic animal domestic pets, these have all increased. Uh, dramatically, you know, since the, uh, you know, inception of, of uh, you know, packaged dog and cat food. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And the zoo, ke- because the zoos maintain a very nutritious diet. They have, they have a staff of veterinarians that monitor the, the, the diet. They're so carefully monitored. There's yeah. these zoo, these zoo primates, the primates, the, the gorillas and the chimps, uh, are very uh, monitored very, very carefully all the time. Uh, nutritional balances, you know, uh, that's why they said if we gave them a big jelly filled donuts and pizza, uh, they would they would hammer it. There, there, there was a, a family of chimps that live with a, a humans. They're, they're on the web. It's oh. a chimp, a group of chimps that live with humans. Mm. You should see these chimps go wild when they get the jelly sandwiches. Oh, they're banging on the table. They're, they're, they're getting all oh, excited man. to eat jelly sandwiches. That's yeah, awful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So <laughs> look at it. It's a, it's a, you yeah. can go on the web. There's a family of chimps. There's a bunch of chimps that live with a human family. Okay. And they like to okay. talk about what they're, the chimps are pounding down all this stuff. Loving it's it. Serious. Banging on the table. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Captain Crunch is going after it. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't? Yeah. I, 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 you can drop off a yeah, box of donuts into the into the pen with the chimps down there. They'd be all over those donuts, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. um, and the other guys that weren't getting the donuts would be all upset. <laughs> yeah, that's so. Funny. Yeah, it is, it's, it's humorous. It just shows you we we as a species have used the technology, the stuff, the sweetness in our evolutionary past was only rare, seasonal, but our technology has now made it permanent. So we can get this sweet stuff all the time yeah. and, and we like it. I mean, uh, we evolved to like sweets. So it's everything has been carefully developed to tweak all of our taste buds to make us want to eat more of this. Even though we put ourselves at risk for cancer, dementia, heart disease, 
diabetes, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. We're, willing, we're willing to still eat the foods that are putting us in that situation because they taste so good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And to your, and to your previous point about, uh, you know, the sort of unholy alliance between food and farm pharma, and pharmacy, um, you know, Dr. Robert Lustig of, of UCSF, he, you know, mentioned one of his, uh, one of his books that the, if I can remember the numbers correctly, the sugar industry makes about $1.3 trillion a year, you know, gross figures. And the, um, like what we spend just treating the metabolic issues that, that are derived from sugar consumption is about $2.4 trillion. So, you know, this is a massive, massive amount. I mean, that, that, that's the entire federal budget, you know, yes. just on eating and, and supporting uh, sugar addiction. Yeah, oh, of course. But if a politician came out uh, and said, listen, uh, our health, our health uh, industry budget is crippling their nations. It's actually uh, causing a, a, a crisis, right? Putting us at, at risk. So we're all going to go back and do paleolithic eating. Okay. We're going to eat tomahawk ribeyes. Yeah. Uh, we're going to cut down on our uh, carcinogenic vegetables. How mm -hmm. long do you think that guy's going to remain in office, right? Yeah. <laughs> They'll vote his ass out right away. Yeah. The, the people don't, you know, but you know, when, 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 when you have the cancer, you, then you all of a sudden, oh, your whole world begins to change. You know, how yeah. come I wasn't told about this and all this? Well, we're telling you now, do you want yeah. to make the choice yeah. or not? You know, it's just. Yeah. So with, with uh, glioblastoma, um, what are you finding, um, you know, what, in, in your animal models, what, what are you finding to be the results when you put them on this, uh, you know, the dawn and the restrictive key, uh, dietary ketosis, how much of a, a benefit are you seeing in, in those? Uh, oh yeah. We're getting three, four times longer survival. Wow. Um, and then we have metastatic cancer. One of the things we've done, um, um, because we take these glioblastoma cells and, and we identified the metastatic cancer as being a, mac, a type of uh, dysplastic macrophage. And mm -hmm. in the GBM, if you look at glioblastoma, many of the so-called mesenchymal cells, the cells that have this mesenchymal phenotype are the most highly invasive because the GBM is a, a, why you could call it multiform. They don't call it multiform anymore. They, they just call it the GB, glioblastoma. But they did call it multiform because of all the different kinds of cells that you would see in there. The mesenchymal kind of cell uh, is the most invasive. And when we took those cells out of the, the brain of the mouse and put them in the flank, they metastasized, they spread all over the body. And then we found out that all metastatic cancers have macrophage characteristics. So we know that we know the nature of the metastatic cell. It's a type of a macrophage, loves glutamine and glucose. So uh, when we put them in the flank, uh, they, they spread all over the body and we use bioluminescence imaging. We can image the tumor cells and see how much they've spread through the, through the body. Then we, we, we call these a term that, you know, we call them terminal mice. They're, they're, they're going to die in a couple of days. You can see the heavy breathing. You can see their immobility. Then we hit them with our diet drug cocktail. And within three or four days, these guys are back walking around like they, 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 they never had anything. But they still have cancer, but it's yeah. been managed. Then you ask, okay, uh, we took these guys from, from death's doorstep. Uh, normally, they would be dead by 30 days uh, if we did nothing or just continue to feed them the high carbohydrate standard lab chow. But then yeah. we got them now to live uh, uh, over, over four and a half months, uh, five times longer than they normally would have. We haven't published this yet, but we plan to publish it once we have the, all of the conditions of the drug diet cocktails uh, uh, defined. We're seeing it for pediatric cancer in the mice. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because we're doing the same thing to these little kids that we do to the adults. You know, we hit them with high dose chemo. We hit them with high radiation. We, we do the same toxic things to little kids yeah. as we do yeah. to adults. And, and we can take these pediatric models that we've developed here at Boston College, and we can keep these mice alive so much longer and in such a higher quality of life. Uh, we know we can get the same results in the, in the pediatric clinic as we see with these natural... Uh, pediatric uh, brain tumors in, in the mice. We know we can keep people alive with advanced metastatic cancer if we do drug diet cocktails at the right time. Don't interfere with this. Don't forget, none of our mice, uh, we do radiation. We never do radiation on any of our mice. So the results that we get, uh, they say, oh, you just get all those great results in the mice. You wouldn't see that in the human. Well, maybe because we don't irradiate the mice. 
So um, if we irradiate the mice, maybe we'll see what we get in the human. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, because um, we're not, we don't plan to do that, you yeah. know, and I don't plan to irradiate. Why am I irradiating? Now, I'm not saying radiation is bad for everything, because I think if you have a tumor in a particular location, it's well-defined, it's not, it's not metastatic, radiation could potentially cure that kind of a tumor. So we don't want to throw all these things uh, under the bus. But we did timazolamide with metabolic therapy, and we showed that it was no better than, uh, timazolamide is the primary uh, uh, chemo for brain cancer. A and uh, we showed that it was no better than metabolic therapy uh, used with hyperbaric oxygen. So, and the mice never got sick with our metabolic therapy. They got sick with the timazolamide. So we tried timazolamide with metabolic therapy. We put, we put them all together. And uh, yeah, they did good, but they didn't do any better than metabolic therapy by mm. itself without the sickness. So I'm saying, why are we doing all this stuff? Why, why are we doing what we're doing? Because temozolomide generates huge revenue for the hospital. Yeah. So uh, we're not interested in the revenue generation here. We're interested in how long we can keep animals alive with yeah. metastatic advanced stage four cancers. Yeah. And uh, that, there's a different, we have a different uh, outcome, different, different perspective on looking at this whole thing. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, so we have, we have uh, achieved levels of success that are beyond anything we would have ex ever expected. Uh, without toxicity. And that's diet drug cocktails that will we'll hammer. And we published a big paper on this called the Press Pulse Therapeutic Strategy with some of my clinician colleagues. And it, sh it outlines the framework for how we would treat human cancers with the Press Pulse Therapeutic Strategy. The diet is the press. And then we use strategic drugs with the diet to pulse them, not chronically use them, but pulse them. And that degrades, slowly degrades the tumor while enhancing the health and vitality uh, of the normal cells. And we think that many cancer patients come into the clinic, they not only have cancer, they often have diabetes, they often have some other uh, comorbidities associated with the fact that they have cancer. In our metabolic press pulse strategies, we not only manage the cancer, reducing it significantly, but we also get rid of the diabetes, we get rid of the hypertension, we get rid of the other uh, comorbidities that these patients also have had, clearly linking all of these chronic diseases to a common underlying uh, provocative situation, which is nutritional imbalance and, uh, and, 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 and diets that provoke and treatments that provoke the growth of, of these tumors and persist on these kinds of conditions. So yeah. clearly, you know, it's, it, 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 once you understand the biology of, this, of the problem, the solutions become much, much more clear and logical. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say too about you know, the radiation. Obviously we do use this in the pediatric populations. Uh, it can be, it can be absolutely devastating to those kids. I think that if I were in a position, you know, even, even not knowing, you know, the, the things that we're talking about now, I, I have thought about this. Uh, I don't think I would ever let my child get, uh, you know, whole, you know uh, radiation for, for a tumor. You might, you, uh, you might not have a choice. Yeah. You might yeah. not have a choice. Because if that child is beyond is lower than 16 years of age or 18, mm. the system determines what you should do to that child. Oh, really? Right? The yeah. system determines. The parents are taken out of the equation. Mm. Unless remember they had the woman went to Mexico to save her the life of her child. The 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 the, the system controls what you do to that child. So even if you said the standard of care involves radiation and chemo for that child very hard to break the system they'll have you arrested as as, as parental neglect yeah that's how that's what i'm talking about the system yeah. is very powerful yeah that's a bit, that, that's definitely too much i've you know i've seen kids uh who have grown up after getting uh radiation like this uh they it completely stunts their mental development and yeah. and so you know where wherever they were it probably damaged them from that point, say they're three, they probably damage them from three and then they never develop past that. And so you have no. this person in this 30 year old body with, you know, the mind of a, of a five year old uh, or less. And it's, it's absolutely tragic to see that. And I just, I, well, I it's that, and the, it that. more tragic, it doesn't have to happen. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to happen. That's the tragedy. Yeah. That's the tragedy. That child could have been rescued. Uh, I'm not saying the child could have been cured, but if the child lives to be the same age, they, yeah. they would be cognitively uh, intact, not, yeah. not uh, cognitively challenged. Yeah. And we, you know, we, we talk about, you know, quality of life and, and we do give people 
the choice, you know, do, is this something that you want to do, you know, given the fact that this is going to be a, a pretty rough road, do you want to just live out your, you know, months or, or whatever, uh, at a better standard of living or, you know, you know, go for the, go for the gold. Uh, you know, I, I think that, especially when you're talking about, about a child who could potentially have such a devastating, uh, uh, damage to their brain and their development. I, for me, I, I would never want that personally. And I, I don't think I would ever want that, that for my child either. No. And, but, and, and no one does, but this is the way, this is the way it is. And um, you often see the child. Um, if you look at their, they, they're given such high dose steroids. Yeah. They get the big moon face. Um, and uh, you know, the steroids are driving blood sugars to extremely high levels. And, and then once you see that phenotype, the big moon face, whether it's in a child or an adult with a glioblastoma, you know, they're finished. You know, that's that, that you know, that the therapy itself is killing those people. And, 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 and that's the tragic. And, and I, what I just said to you in that statement that I just made is not known to the majority of the cancer of, of practitioners in the field. They are under the impression that this is helping their patient. This is the gap in knowledge that needs to be closed. We cannot continue to do this toxic therapy on these poor people, whether it's a child or an adult. It speaks to the lack of knowledge on the part of the field treating a disease. Okay, it has to change. It mm -hmm. has to change. Otherwise, we have to continue to see this, these tragedies one after another not only in America, throughout the world. You're in Australia, they're doing the same thing down there as we do yeah. here in England, Germany, Japan. They're all doing the same thing. Hmm. It's, a tra it's, a, it's a worldwide tragedy. Yeah. And I, it will only change once it comes to the realize that cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease with, uh, we, could, we could make an, a, a dent in this disease so quick if people knew what I, what I just said. You know, yeah. it's the problem is either they, they don't want to know about it. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to talk about it for various reasons. Yeah. Um, on that, on that note, uh, what are, you mentioned there was some, there are some uh, clinics and, and uh, centers that are using this uh, as a model. Where, where are these guys at and, and how are they getting away with it? Well, well, then I, I, th I think there are small clinics, um, you know, that have, um, uh, uh, you know, pa patients have to be they have to be offered an alternative. You know, right now, if you go to the main hospitals like Dana Farber, MD Anderson, you know, Sloan Kettering, and Moffitt Cancer Center, and wherever where else wherever else they have these major cancer centers, you're not offered. They're not offering metabolic therapy. Yeah. Um, offer metabolic therapy. See what the patients. Is. And the problem is, of course, if you're going to be Dana Farber, MD Anderson. Uh, you want to do metabolic, there's no one there to really, that knows what to do. Hmm. Um, so how do you, you have to have a, a staff of professionals that know what to do and how to do it, okay? Without that knowledge base and the young people going through medical schools in the oncology area, they're not trained to do metabolic therapy, mm -hmm. you know? Um, th so where is the training coming from? Uh, I work with uh, people we have written a protocol to treat cancer patients based on metabolic therapy with uh, Miriam Kalamian, uh, a world-renowned expert on keto for cancer and diet for this. She's helped a lot of cancer patients. We, we, we write a treatment protocol. Can it be used? It will not be used in the major hospitals, of course, because mm -hmm. you're, you're doing it as an alternative to radiation and chemo and immunotherapies and these other kinds of things but it can be done in smaller clinics and smaller clinics that are not so yoked by the system uh, to do what they have to do. And the goal is to keep people alive and have the people themselves tell everyone that this is what I did. Guy Tannenbaum is on the web, uh, overcome his uh, stage four prostate cancer using metabolic approaches. So you're getting more and more vocal advocates that are telling others that listen, do metabolic. Now, is it easy? Don't, I don't want to let people think that, oh, doing metabolic therapy is a cakewalk because a lot of the uh, success rides on your shoulders. How yeah. compliant are you to not eat carbohydrates, <coughs> which can be very hard for a lot of people. You yeah. Know? It was, um, that, that's one of the things, you know, I see in, in clinic <coughs> here in neurosurgery 
you know, we get, we get these people with the GBMs. It's this devastating uh, diagnosis, obviously. I think, I think every single patient that I've ever uh, done a consultation with, and we, and we do this once a week, we have everyone come in with all the new diagnoses. And I, I don't think there's a single person that hasn't asked me, okay, what can I do? How can I yeah. do this? What, what can I do? They really want to be a part of this. They, they don't want to feel uh, helpless. Like this is just out of their control. And I, I remember getting really upset uh, at another, at another physician who, um, you know, basically said, you know, they, they asked him sort of like, you know, you, well, should I stop eating sugar? Should I, do, should I stop drinking alcohol or I mean, what should I do? And they're like, you know what, you probably don't have that long anyway. So just do whatever you want. And, it, and, yeah. and I was, I was furious at that. Um, yeah. the person looked so defeated. I was like, yeah, I guess it, I guess it just doesn't matter. And I was like, of course it matters. It absolutely matters. You have control. You have, you know, you have a say in this, you have a dog in this fight. You are able yeah. to affect your own, your own course of your life. And, uh, and, and, and just seeing their eyes, like literally hope just rising in their eyes. And yeah. I, you know, I try to, I try to mitigate that because, you know, this isn't, this isn't good any way you cut it. But, you know, I, I tell them, I tell them about your work. I point them in, in the direction of your uh, uh, material and, and studies. And I just say, hey, look, I'm not telling you that this is going to cure anything. It's not going to stop anything. But there's a lot of evidence that says like, if you do this, this will help. And like here, just, you know, go to the source, yeah. here, see what you think. You're 100% correct about that. And I, I can't emphasize that more that, than what you just said. Because I see people, once they understand about the glucose ketone index, that they are measuring their own blood every day, not every day, but every other day or whatever, using a little meter and they're collecting the numbers and they know what direction those numbers have to go in for that therapy to be effective. They, they get really motivated. Mm -hmm. They now know that they are able to do something. They are in control of their own destiny and they work very, very hard and they become extremely motivated. This is what Pablo did. So when he knew what numbers he had to achieve in order to put pressure on the growth of that tumor, he knew he was in control. And you give the patient now power. They have the power and they get motivated to know what they need to do. You're absolutely right. Nobody should ever be told there's nothing more we can do. The, yeah. These people can do, especially at the beginning, especially yeah. at the beginning of their disease. And then they, then they have to know that it's a, it's a long haul it doesn't have like, oh, I can do it. You know, I'm, I'm really good at this for a month. No, no, you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to bite the bullet on this. So, so, uh, and power it through until, until you have achieved control of that, of that growth. The growth does not control, you control the growth. Yeah. And the patient can do that with the proper motivation, with the proper training. So I can't emphasize more of what you just said. You got to let these patients know that they're part of the fight. Yeah. And, and they and they can control this and and you'd be surprised how how much longer these people live in a higher quality of life and when they I don't want to say they all pass mm -hmm. but I I've had I've had people tell me or their loved ones told me that uh, this guy fought the fight he was uh, felt so good about himself and even though he may may not have made it all the way. He lived two, three times longer than he was supposed to live at a much higher quality of life and never had to su suffer and die in, in these pa painful situations. And then there's many people who are still fighting the fight and should have died a long time ago. And they're still, they're still on. And I tell, if I had the drugs that work with the diet, uh, we, we, would we would be able to settle this in a much more uh, uh, defined period of time. So yeah. Uh, um, yeah, there's a lot of hope for the future. The, I, I would say the future of cancer is bright, not yeah. bleak. You know, yeah. uh, it's a whole new strategy. And, and, and I think that, that the future of cancer, we can, we can keep this disease managed and, and people are gonna emerge in a healthier state and feel much better about themselves. Yeah. Um, uh, that's, my, that's my view. I base it on my understanding of the biology of the disease and 30 years of research in the field looking at this problem. So, uh, and publishing all these papers. And, uh, and it, this is the way I see it. So I, 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 think, I, think, I think the future is, is far brighter than it should be, uh, than people make it out to be. Yeah, good. Yeah, and I, 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 yeah, I agree with you. And just, and just trying to get this out there and, and let people know that they actually have a say in this and then they can actually affect 
the course of this disease. They're not just out of control and just at the whims of the chemo and radiation, but they actually have, have something to say in this as well. Um, I was going to say, wh when did you get uh, sort of focused in this, in this line of research? I know that when you were doing, when you were at Yale, you were doing research onto uh, seizures and uh, preventing mm -hmm. seizures with, with ketosis, which is, you know, which is something that you know, I've looked into. And it's like, we've been using this for nearly 90 years to treat yeah. refractory seizures. And it's something that almost no neurologist that I know of use. And I've, I've seen a lot of people with epilepsy and spoken to them. I've always asked them, you know, have they ever spoken to you about uh, your diet? Not a single one has, has said yes, which, which just blows my mind because it's such an such a simple thing. It may not be easy to implement, but it is straightforward and it has a lot of evidence behind it. Yeah. Well, don't forget uh, 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 what I was doing at Yale at that time, Yale was one of the leaders in the field of epilepsy research. Gilbert mm -hmm. Glasser was the chair of the department, uh, had written many, many distinguished books and papers on, on epilepsy. And they told me, because uh, I was working on gangliocide biochemistry at the time too, um, looking at different uh, disorders of lipid metabolism. But they said, if you want to stay at Yale, you better work on something to do with epilepsy. So we were mapping genes, map genes for epileptic uh, seizures. And oh, everybody was excited, map genes. And because the idea was if you map the gene, you could figure out the product and you could make a treatment for that product. The right. problem is, and then I realized that, well, that didn't always, they always use the same kind of chemicals and things all the time. Why don't we try keto? I, I didn't do ketogenic diet until I came to Boston. I tried to get a grant at Yale, uh, but they said, oh, nobody's interested in ketogenic diets for epilepsy. And we have all these drugs. But then Jim Abrams of, of uh, the movie industry mm -hmm. uh, produces the film First Do No Harm with Meryl Streep. Mm -hmm. And his son, Charlie, had epilepsy. And he started the Charlie Foundation. And he brought together a lot of people in the epilepsy field to look at uh, why are we not using ketogenic diets to manage epilepsy when it was known since 1921 by Wilder at Mayo Clinic. Why are we not doing this? So uh, one of my students went out to the meeting because we were still doing looking at epilepsy and come back and said, hey, listen, we should put our mice on ketogenic diets. And sure enough, we mapped all these genes. But the thing of it is the diet blocked the seizures. It yeah. <laughs> was, uh, was really quite an interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, and then calorie restriction um, uh, was even more powerful along with ketogenic diets. And, and then uh, we were working on the gangliosides for brain cancer. We were doing a lot of work on brain cancer. Mm -hmm. And then we said, uh, why don't we see if the diet works on brain cancer? And then I said, oh my God, you know, this is unbelievable. What's going on here? Then we discovered Otto Warburg had said this many, many years ago. Yeah. You know, yeah. we know that the, the tumors can't burn ketones for energy because they're mitochondria defective. They need glucose, so the glucose is low, ketones are elevated. Wow, makes perfect sense. Otto Warburg was right. So then yeah. send us off into a into a, a better understanding of how we man manage cancer metabolically, coming from our understanding of how ketogenic wor diets work on epileptic seizures. And actually, we still don't know the mechanism by which ketogenic diets block epilepsy, because mm -hmm. it's a very complicated brain wiring uh, scenario that has to be has to be looked into but it became crystal clear as yeah. how this diet could stop cancer growth or restrict cancer growth. And the fact is that we have tens of thousands of little kids around the world using ketogenic diets every day to manage their seizures. Yet when you talk about it in cancer, they talk, oh, it could hurt the kid, it could hurt the patient, it could hurt this, <laughs> oh, the toxic effects of ketogenic diet. What are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, we have thousands of little kids doing ketogenic diets for epilepsy, and, and nobody's talking about that. But when you take a, a, a little kid with cancer, oh no, it's, it's, it's terribly toxic. It's nutritionally impact. What are you nuts? Yeah. Compared <laughs> to radiation and chemo? You're telling yeah. me the ketogenic diet is more harmful than radiation and chemo? Yeah. I mean, give me a break. Yeah. So, uh, um, I mean, this is the, the absurdity of dealing. So yeah, we, 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 have, we came to this state where we are through a long circuitous path, not knowing where any of this would have ever, ever taken us. But we were aware enough of the underlying mechanisms of action to know what we were doing, why we were doing it, and how it works. Now the big challenge is getting the word out to people and seeing more and more success stories of using this. Now Jethro Yu at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles has a big trial on ketogenic diet for glioblastoma. And he's getting spectacular results, more than he would have ever imagined. Mm. But, and that's still with upfront standard of care. 
And he knew, he and I know, I said, if you took away that radiation and chemo, your results would probably be even more spectacular. Yeah. You know? So it's just, it takes the time for the system to come to adjust and realize what's happening here. Yeah. There, there, there is a clear mechanism of action. It's a very clear mechanism of action. Yeah. So uh, it just takes time. That's, that's all. But I, I feel that this time is being uh, wasted and we're sacrificing all these poor kids and adults yeah. and cancer. And it's just, that's the tragedy that this doesn't have to happen. And yet yeah. it's happening. Yeah. Um, that's sort of, uh, uh, just, you know, raise the question. So the, these damaged mitochondria, obviously this is, this is precipitating this, this issue. Can that ever reverse? Or, I mean, is it, obviously there can always be a point of no return, but does that ever come back? Um, and, yeah, well, um, uh, that was one of the big, that was one of the big things that I did when I, when I uh, bundled together all the nuclear mitochondrial transfer experiments that were done in animal, animal systems over decades. Mm -hmm. all independent of each other, done by some of the best developmental biologists uh, in, in the field. And I spoke to many, some of these individuals. So if you, take, if you take the nucleus of the tumor cell that has all the mutations that are supposedly drivers, and you put that, drop that nucleus into a new cytoplasm, you get uh, growth regulation, not growth dysregulation. And sometimes wow. you can form a whole frog or a mouse uh, from the, 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 the nucleus of a tumor cell. So you replaced essentially the bad mitochondria. In other words, you put that nucleus into a cytoplasm with fresh mitochondria. And that, those new mitochondria are able to re-regulate -re the growth and development despite the continued presence of the so-called driver gene mutations that were supposed to. I mean, this is, this is the hardest evidence yeah. you can say against this gene theory. So, and if you do the reverse, if you take the normal nucleus and drop it into a cytoplasm that has cancerous mitochondria, mitochondria, the, 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 the cell will either die or form dysregulated uh, cancer cells. So this was clear evidence. Getting back yeah. to your question, um, can we revert uh, cancer by putting new mito, it's called mitochondrial therapy, yeah. actually. Um, and you know, I think that's gonna come in the future. I, I think it's so, uh, it's so uh, new that eventually we will be able to use, maybe replace. But you know, I, I don't want to, at this point, say, let's see if we can uh, uh, restore the growth regulation of a, of a cancer cell by putting new mitochondria. I think it's better at this point to kill them off, uh, get rid of them, uh, yeah. put them in a, in a, in a, lock, a growth lock hold, uh, mm -hmm. rather than trying to re-educate them in the event you get recidivism. And, I, and we don't yeah. want that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, I, I mean, everything is, but I think mitochondrial therapy for the future is going to be really ex exciting and interesting. But yeah. I don't think we're there yet. So okay. let's, let's, let's work with what we can do and make a real big difference. And then we'll move forward uh, with these newer, newer kinds of things for the future. Um, but yeah. right now, let's just put a lock hold on these cancer cells and keep people alive in a healthier state. And if yeah. that means eating tomahawk ribeyes, I think, I think you'll find <laughs> a mean? number of people that would buy onto that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's me, you know, just the, you know, that, that experiment that you, spoke of, you know, you know, taking the nucleus and, and putting it into a new cytoplasm and, and the mitochondria and showing that you, know, you have all these genetic changes and it doesn't behave as cancer and you take the mitochondria and put them in and it does behave as cancer. I mean, that's QED as far as I'm concerned. You know? Yeah, but it's still, uh, so the, the response by the oncology field is they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to look at it and they don't, uh, and, and, and they don't want to hear about it. So, yeah. so you put that, that's because it's so devastating to an entire industry that uh, once, once that becomes more widely recognized yeah. uh, and it's been repeated over and over in all different, different kinds of models. Um, so what's the holdup? Yeah. What is the holdup here? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody yeah. has to scratch their head and say, what, why, why are we continued to persist with therapies that put patients at risk for all kinds of health diseases mm. when we, when we have a solution or a, or a, a better a better approach to management than we currently have. Yeah. What is the holdup here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so if someone were to you know you know, have cancer now, and and uh, you know what would what would be the you know the best diet? Obviously, you know ketogenic or or even carnivore, but you know eliminating that out. What ratio are they looking for? Um, uh, to get and like what what is sort of the best way for people to manage this at home if they don't have access to one of these 
uh, clinics that are, are um, popping up. Well, that's the, you, 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 as I said in the letters that I sent to people, you know, I'm not a physician. I can't tell yeah. you what to do and what not to do. All I can do is provide you with uh, information, knowledge from published papers and, and observations. And I'll let the physicians in the clinics uh, treat the patients. You know, we know what we need to do. As I said, the first, now a lot of people cannot do water only fasting because it's too, too much of a shock. The brain is addicted to glucose and it's, it's just as difficult to get off glucose as it is to get off heroin, alcohol and nicotine uh, and these kinds of things. But the body, the body can adjust to the change. So you will have withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. But what we realized, what we realized is that if the patient were to uh, gradually transition to a zero carbohydrate diet for several weeks, um, even that can be difficult for some patients, for yeah. some individuals. But it's not as much of a jump to do a water only. I tried it, man. It, go cold turkey on, on, on carbs is really, really tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I mean, you start to, you can smell stuff cooking like blocks yeah. away, you know, it, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, so, but it's too, it's too hard. And, and so what we've learned is that patients can transition to water only fasting after a couple of weeks uh, on, 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 uh, on zero carb diets and, you know, with meat, um, uh, no carbs at all. Yeah. Vegetables. We're not, we're not uh, as opposed as you might be. <laughs> uh, but if we can get an organic, if we can get an organic, or, 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 or grow the vegetables in your backyard using manure and these kinds of things. Yeah. But, but, but I tell you, then the transition to water only fasting for a few days, bring those blood sugars down, bring the ketones up, get into the new diet state. Then you hit them with the drugs, uh, the, the drug like Don and, and some of the other uh, drugs and Benz's all these parasite medications, man, they're oh. powerful. Yo, okay. damn. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, you hit with the embendazole, fenbendazole. Uh, they, okay. they they target some of the metabolic pathways that the cancer cells need. Okay. So so all this stuff is uh, cheap. Now here's the interesting thing: embendazole was really cheap. It's a parasite medication, right? Yeah. For worms, some sort of worms, and, yeah. and uh, yeah. you can get the, the pills over in India for for uh, fifty cents a tablet. But now yeah. when we realized in the United States, they work on cancer, it's $300 a tablet. Oh, yeah, you tell yes. me what, you tell me what's what the drive in this industry. Yeah. It's not, help, it's, it's a revenue generation. So we call that Scarelli, Mark, you know, the guy, Martin Scarelli, the, the most hated man in America who made the EpiPens like $800 when they used right. to be, remember yeah. that guy? Yeah. yeah. He took advantage of the system because he could, everybody hated the guy, but you know, the pharmaceutical industry is the same thing. They just don't broadcast. It's yeah. called Scarelli. You Scarelli the price of all these things because yeah. you know you can make a buck on it. It's terrible, right? It's it's, it's yeah. really despicable behavior. No, it is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but that's the way. That's the business of America, right? The business. That's what Calvin Coolidge said. The business of America is business. Right. So so the so but you know these are the drugs. You can get drugs on the cheap, uh, as long as you know how to use them. Um, hmm. you, you put them together with uh, diet drug combinations, and you can get a really good, powerful uh, uh, management of cancer. Uh, but you have to have knowledgeable people. They have to know yeah. doses, timing, and scheduling. And uh, this is all quite quite doable. Uh, the framework was already there. We published the framework. So people are willing to know how to do this. They're willing to take it. And uh, so cancer patients should be uh, seen. They can, sure, they can do a lot of it themselves as long as they're educated and told what to do and how to do it. Yeah. And then you have non-invasive imaging technology that can monitor their cancer to see whether or not it's growing, whether or not it's stabilized, or whether or not it's still there or not. So we don't need to be taking punch biopsies and doing all this crazy stuff. To What are you doing biopsies for? Everybody's, oh, I got to have a biopsy of my cancer. Why? Oh, I don't know if it's malignant. Well, if it's malignant, you should never take a punch biopsy. <laughs> you could spread it all over the damn body, right? Yeah. And if it's yeah. benign, what the hell are you sticking a benign tumor for, right? Yeah. So they want to get a gene profile on the cells that come out of your tumor to tell you what kind of a a, a new drug, a, a new toxic drug that will target that mutation. But the damn cell is using glucose and glutamine. Why don't you target that before you stick the tumor? I mean, every, everything we're doing is like back ass forward. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, you got to know what to do, how to do it, educate people, educate the practitioners, and things will begin to change. Yeah. Have to change. Can't continue to do what we're doing. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, Professor Seyfried, I'm I'm so appreciative of your time. I don't want I don't want to take uh, your whole day, 
Um, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to speak with you. I've been, I've been referencing your work and pointing people towards you uh, for a number of years now. And I, I, I really, um, really appreciate this uh, opportunity to speak with you. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I, and I hope uh, some of this information uh, can help people. Well, I, I think, um, I know it will. yeah. And, you know, and our, and our support that we have um, comes from philanthropy and yeah. private foundations. So obviously there are people who recognize uh, what we are doing and what we are saying and the strategies because they know there are good people who say, you're doing the right thing, let me support what you're doing. Because it's very hard to get the federal government uh, uh, granting systems through the National Cancer Institute. When everybody thinks cancer is a genetic disease and you're coming along telling them it's not, uh, you don't go very far in getting funds from, for, for doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll keep pushing. We have good yeah. preclinical, the best preclinical model systems, the best trained staff and knowledgeable staff, and we're not going anywhere. Good. Uh, we're pushing forward on this until un, until the job is done. So uh, thanks uh, for listening. Yeah. And uh, I hope this uh, uh, helps your uh, podcast audiences. Well, I hope it does too. And and there are certainly people um, you know that that are suffering from cancer or that will be you know, will become afflicted by it. And I think anyone who's who sees this and has knows someone with cancer, I, I really encourage them to send this over to them so that they can really understand what's going on and, and actually really understand that they have a lot more to say in their own uh, you know, uh, prognosis and recovery uh, than they might think they do. Um, Professor Seyfried, where's the best place uh, for people to find you and find your work? And you, know, you mentioned uh, you know, the letter that you, your email that you send out to people. Yeah. Is there like a, a link to a website or something that people can- Yeah, there, there's, there's a link to um, um, the Foundation for Cancer Metabolic Therapies. Uh, we, 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 we obtain money uh, uh, from private foundations. Yeah. Um, people also support us through Boston College. You know, they, they, they can direct funds directly to my, to my research program. Okay. So, so, you know, these kinds of things and, and believe it or not, yeah, we, uh, more and more people, uh, are coming out to support this, um, uh, because it's going, it's going to have a greater impact in supporting almost anything else in, in the cancer field. There's no question about that. Yeah. So, uh, the faster we get our papers published, the yeah. more evidence we continue to our case reports, human case reports, we work, we do that. So I, I help the physicians write up the case reports on the patients that have survived longer than, than would be expected. It takes a lot of my time, of course, but, yeah. but, I, but I'm willing to do this. And, we, and our uh, peer-reviewed scientific publications continue to push this field forward. And this is, uh, it requires funding to do this because we have yeah. to, well, there's animal costs, staff costs, um, uh, consumables, uh, you know, things that we use, equipment costs to maintain. Um, so, so bottom line is, yeah, um, you know, I send a letter out, it has information, helps cancer patients make decisions, try to get them in the right context, people who understand what's going on, and then they take it from there. Yeah. So um, this has been the plan so far. It seems to be gaining more and more momentum um, as more and more uh, word gets out about this whole cancer thing and uh, things begin to change. Fantastic. Well, I... I'll put up all, all those information and those links in the description and I encourage people to go and, and visit and to donate if they, if they can possibly do so, because I think that this, this sort of work is really. And the letters and the letters that I send out, it's not, it's only donation. If you can, if you feel that that's helps you, right. Um, you know, if something helps you, you might consider donation. Uh, I, I'm not asking anybody. It's only if the information that I send is of value and I don't charge anything for this. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is, is to get the, is to see the results uh, yeah. uh, more than, you know, anything else. And, and that's, I think that's the most important thing at this stage. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I, there's a lot of things that I do that I don't, I don't get paid for. I, you know, sp you know, stay late and talk to people and talk to people outside of the hospital to try and to try and get them uh, better because that's, yeah. you know, that, that's, that's sort of why we're here. And I, and I, you know, I think a, a lot of people, a lot of doctors and, and researchers are still in that mindset, but unfortunately some have forgotten that or forgotten that it's even possible to, to do that anymore. And you're just sort of, just sort of milling these things out as, as numbers, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 
Anyway, I'll let you go. Thank you very much. And thank you, um, thank you yeah. for the interview. Thank you. I really appreciate it.